You're looking good, Jeff. Hi, fans. Hi, sports fans. <laughs> yes, it's sports fans who watch Carcon Carne. Uh, so I'm recording an episode of Carcon Carne with a hero, a legend, Jeff Pizzotti of Naked Ray Gun. Welcome to the car. You're eating, uh, we're eating diner food today. Thanks, James. I'm having Eggs Benedict. Which is delicious any time of day. Uh, Carcon Carne is sponsored by Boost Mobile. And we are outside Hollywood at North and Ashland. This is like a, a Wicker Park favorite. This is uh, a 2 o'clock in the morning, get your belly full of a Monte Cristo sandwich kind of food. It really is. Greasy, uh. greasy the better, and it's a great place. It's quick service, and, and uh, I can't say enough about the Hollywood Diner. It's Carcon Carne. So let's talk a little bit about Naked Ray Gun. It seems that in, over the past few years, there's been renewed interest, I mean, besides the fact that you guys came back, uh, but there's been renewed interest from a higher level. Uh, your biggest fan is one of the biggest rock stars on earth. It, Dave Grohl can't set foot in Chicago without mentioning Naked Ray Gun. I, I, I saw both Foo Fighters shows this summer. Both nights, he made a point of saying that Naked Ray Gun was the first band he ever saw at Cubby Bear. What, has that had an impact on you? It's pretty crazy that Dave Grohl likes us that much. Um, it's not crazy. It's He's got good taste in that in that matter, in that, <laughs> as far as that goes. But um, he, he insists on idolizing not only the band, but the Cubby Bear itself, which is kind of weird. A little weird. Much as I like the owner, George, and everything. It's a great, 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 place, great place for sports, but I don't know if from your music, really. But, I mean, you have... It, it's, a, it's a nostalgic, emotional connection. That's where he got turned on right. to the power of punk rock and live music. So, of course, there's that emotional... As he says it, as he says it, um, the singer was on my head. <laughs> what does that mean? I think I was, you know, I, I sing at the front of stage and mm -hmm. people are diving over me and stuff and I think he felt like he never saw anything like that before. He was really blown away by it. Well, Naked Ray Gun, let, let's, let's go back. The 1980s, I mean, Ray Gun was emblematic of Chicago music in the 80s. It's emblematic to this day. I mean, Naked Ray Gun is synonymous with Chicago. What was it like? What, what was the music scene like? Was it was it rougher? Was it harder to cut through? Was it weird? What was it like in the 80s? For those of us who may have been kids or not even born when Ray Gun was taking off. When it first started, it was you knew everybody. You knew every single person. You knew what people didn't come to your show. You knew what people did come to your show. Because you knew everybody. It was a very close-knit community. And you didn't like everybody, but it was close knit. Uh, uh, it's all different kind of factions of people. There were there were people there for the wrong reasons. People there for really strictly political reasons, like communist reasons and Nazi reasons. And so well, there was that whole skinhead movement. Yeah, it was, but they they weren't even skinheads necessarily. They were just into that kind of thing. They weren't there for the music really. There were some people, a lot of people there for just the music. A lot of people there for other reasons, but. That made it kind of interesting too, because they're really eclectic, leftover people who didn't fit in anywhere. Came to the, uh, came to one club, and it was a banyan for me. But I, I didn't, I never saw the Mary Ray Pair. It was close by the time I got together around. But a banyan yeah, packed a lot of different kind of people in there, mm -hmm. had a lot of different tastes. But the music was always great. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what drew me to the, the music. Well, I think about the idea of you playing Cubby Bear back in the day, like the Wrigleyville of today is so different from the Wrigleyville of Naked Ray Gun circa 1985. It, th there was an element of danger to Wrigleyville back then. There was, where Shubas is now in Belmont, was really dangerous. Mm -hmm. We didn't go over there very often. Only in two, two, I was going to see, I was going to see uh, uh, John Fox's band. Who's John Fox? Alter Fox there once, and they canceled. But I saw 999 there, 999 there mm -hmm. a bunch of times, and I saw a bunch of other good bands there, but it was dangerous to go over there. You could get mugged going over there. Yeah, that's not the, not the case now. No, it's $100 million condos over there. I, I should mention as we're doing this, uh, Josh Caterer just uh, checked in. Uh, Josh, of course, of Smoking Popes, who you're playing with yeah. in just about a month and a half. Uh, it is Jawbreaker at the Aragon. It is Naked Ray Gun and Smoking Popes. That right there, that's a show. That's it. That's all you need to see for the rest of the year. It's, it's going to be a good show. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be an amazing show. Josh has the voice of an angel. 
He does. Josh is one of my favorite vocalists and favorite human beings. Uh, in fact, he does the theme song for this podcast. Um, but that's exciting. I mean, Naked Ray Gun coming back out, taking the stage. That that's a thrill. That's an exciting moment for us. Good time, yeah. I love I love you know, talking about Josh more. I love his band Duval. Mm-hmm. I listen to the record endlessly. So good. I, I love that. I, you're a music fan. That's yeah. what I love about Jeff Pizzotti of Naked Reagan. I mean, you're just a music fan. Yeah, um, I am. So, Naked Reagan isn't necessarily a full time thing for you at this point. No, um, it's about the only thing I do to make money, though. I uh, pretty much retired. My girlfriend and I, my fiance and I, just fixed up this old house in Amboy, Illinois, near Dixon. And it's, uh, it was built before the Civil War, and it needs a lot of love, and we just give it a lot of love, and we fix it up, us and our two dogs. Did you, did you crave a, a rural life? Did you have enough of uh, being Jeff Pizzotti in the big city? Um, we were kind of looking for something a little slower, so, yeah. And we got a house really cheap, and it's a nice town, and it's a beautiful house. And it was, one time it was a, a little small mansion, so we're kind of putting it back together, and it's going to be really nice when we're done with it. There are times when I go through smaller, more rural areas of Illinois where I think, yeah, I could do that. Like at some point, I yeah, could, yeah. I, I can make a case for that. So I get it. Yeah, I, I get what you're doing. Uh, Daryl Wilson of the Bull Weevils uh, oh, chimed in to Hi, call, call you a hero, Thanks, which Darryl. you are. I mean, it's interesting. I, have you ever heard that Brian Eno quote about the Velvet Underground? Something along the lines of, "Only thirty thousand people bought their first album, but." All those people ended up starting a band. Right. I feel like that's the way about or the thing with Naked Raygun. Maybe X amount of people only heard Raygun back in the day, but everyone who did started a band. I mean, I'm looking at the Bull Weevils or Smoking Popes, and I can't imagine them not being inspired by Naked Raygun. I think they were inspired, and I think they probably inspired a lot of people to start bands because that's what the Ramones did originally. They started all the bands. They went to England, and from that show. Everybody that who's there started a band practically. G- Generation X started from there. The Buzzcocks started from there. Susie Nabanshi started from there. Uh, it goes on and on. The list goes on and on. All those people started bands and influenced us. I love that. So when you jumped back in in 06, did Riot Fest, what was the thought process then? Like, Reagan's just so inextricably part of you. Did you just think, yeah, I, this is, I'm going to ride this to the end? Um... We really just thought that thought about that one show, and then as long as we were together, I mean, this is a really good eggs Benedict I'm having here. Yeah, take your time. There's no rush. It's the beauty of a podcast. As long as we were I together, myself am going to eat. Might as well do some more shows. So we felt like we have to do a nice tour of the West Coast. Mm-hmm. We never made it back to Europe, but we did, we did an East Coast tour, two West Coast tours, and a lot of one-off dates were nice. We got flown some places and played, and then it. Died down a little bit. We didn't put out any new records. Now, now we have a new record coming out, though. It's all recorded. Are you serious? It's all, it's all recorded. It's very good songs, too, yeah. I'll record it just as we mix it. it. Sounds great. Really good. So, and it's such a different process now. I mean, back in the day, there was a very clear path to record, get it out, release it. I guess the urgency isn't there anymore, which might be a blessing and curse. Like, there's not... It's, it is a blessing and curse, because you take your sweet-ass time doing it, right. but... But uh, in the in the past, the record company would make you get these records out there. And we had, we had to crank, crank a record out every like 10 months or something when we were on Caroline and Homestead. And mm-hmm. it was good because it made us work. It made us put songs out there. And now we're just taking five years to put an album out. <laughs> but that's exciting. So how do you prepare for a show like the Jawbreaker show? Where it's not necessarily your crowd. I'm sure plenty of people there are, are there to see you. But do you mix in some of these new songs you're talking about? Or do you just... Is it old favorites? We've been talking about that. It's going to be mostly old favorites. There'll be one or two new songs. But stuff that's been released on single before. We put a couple. We put three singles out with mm-hmm. B-sides since then. And it'll be something that's on there. Maybe one brand new one. And then a couple from the singles. And anything else will be really old. Uh, We're debating, debating doing I Lie now. I don't know if I'm going to do I Lie. But it's, it's I love been, that. It's been requested that, by some people. That, that's... That is old school Naked Ray Gun. That's really old school. That's the oldest school Naked yeah. Ray Gun, for sure. As old as it gets. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dennis Buckley from 88 Fingers Louie just chimed in to say hello, lads. So as you look back on decades of Naked Ray Gun, and as we talk about you know, influencing, influencing other bands, it's a weird thing to ask a living, active musician, but do you think about things like legacy? 
No, never think about it. You it's just do probably what you a do. good thing. You just do what you do. Hmm? You just do what I do. That's all you can do. Okay, good. Because I, I think some artists do get caught up in that. They get in their own heads about impact and whatnot. Just keep on being naked Raygun. Yeah, the Ramones seem to be really hung up on that. They were, they were always so sad that they were, weren't bigger. And their, their last, last film was terrible. It's just so, so depressing to watch them wonder why they're not bigger, wonder why they're not gigantic. And, and they really put a lot of effort into it. They played, they played all the friggin' time. They played so often that Joey almost got sick all the time. And he, and he never took care of his mental problems. His OCD was so bad. He would have to count the stairs if he came down from his apartment. Sometimes he'd be on the stairs counting stairs for like 10 minutes. For like I didn't 10 know of, that. Like more, more than an hour or something, and Johnny would have to go get him. But uh, Ramones, I think, thought about that too much. But we don't, we don't really consider... We, we play for people who come to the show. You know, We don't really care who comes to the show. If, 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 not, if it's a small show, that's, that's fine. We play who's there for who's there, you know? But we always did. We played for seven people before. And you treat it like... You're like, a, like it's a thousand, you know? Right, that you want all seven of those people to walk out hardcore fans and tell right. their friends so that next right. time, right. it's more than seven. Right. Uh, I will say, speaking of Ramones, probably one of the top five loudest bands I've ever seen in concert. Really? Absolutely. I saw, I've seen them when they weren't that loud. There was a Riviera show they did where it was just one of those shows where you, like the, the bass sound feels like a, a physical force. Yeah. Like, I would rank that up there with Motorhead as be, far as loudest bands I've ever seen. It could be a Riviera problem. I saw Bob Mulder, I had to leave. Really? Okay, yeah. maybe it is a Riviera. The trouble was cut my head off. The trouble was they cut my freaking head off. Okay, here's the, I'm, I'm going to totally sidetrack, but you'll appreciate this as a longtime Chicago yeah. guy. Going to the Riviera now kind of sucks because they close off the floor. Like, you don't have unlimited access to the floor. If you don't get there by a certain time... What do you mean? I mean, once that floor is packed, you can't get on it. So if you show so, up... If for whatever reason you show up just in time for the headliner, you're kind of screwed. You got to stand by the back bar with no visibility. My friend Matt Cosgrove jumped off the balcony at one of our shows. <laughs> the Riviera. That's how, you, lived, that's how you get to the main floor. And lived. <laughs> that's exactly how you get to the main floor. Uh, and lived to tell the tale. Yeah, Matt Cosgrove. He's a maniac. <laughs> Still kind of a maniac. <laughs> that, that's amazing. That's ama- see. That's what Naked Ray Gun does to people. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, as you look back on shows, and maybe we'll just focus on Chicago. What moments like that, what memories do you have of performing that you're just going to take with you to the end? Like, just those indelible moments on stage or around you. I did the stupidest thing at Exit ones, Exit Show. The old Exit, Wells old Exit on Wells yeah. near Lincoln. It used to be like, they say it used to be a Duesenberg engine shop, and it's kind of made without without any columns in it. It's made with an arch ceiling, mm-hmm. arch ceiling, arch roof in the back, so it has trusses, no columns, so it's a big open space. Small open space. And I took my microphone from the stage and I threw it over one of those beams. And I spun out over the crowd. I put my legs over my head and I fell on my neck in, a, in the dance pit, right on the concrete. Oh I, thought I, was gonna, I thought I was paralyzed. It was <laughs> and so, you lived to tell the tale. Yeah, it was terrible. I went around off the stage and I just grabbed my neck. I was like, ow, oh, that's such a pain. I saw mine came back. Are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm going to live. But it was, it was a really bad, really stupid thing to do. But anyway, I did it. Uh, any memories that are memories for the right reasons? Um, Other than risk to self? You know, I can't... I just like singing with the crowd, you know? It's too bad the air gun's going to be... The stage, so, the stage is so high at the air gun, I won't be able to do that. Yeah. The stage is terrible at the air gun. It's also very echoey. Very terrible place to see a band. It'll be a great place to see Naked Ray on the Smoking Popes and Jawbreaker, though. Yeah. Well, I saw I saw Marcy there. He pulled the sound up pretty well. Mm-hmm. I saw him there at least two or three times. With new music on the way, whenever it may drop, as the kids say. Yeah. Um, where do you where do you find inspiration these days? By the way, I'm, I'm chocolate shake with my chocolate shake. Chocolate shake. Event, I recommend it. Uh, so where do you find inspiration? I mean, you're not the angry young punk. No, no. I I wrote a song about. It's kind of funny. You find it's hard to hard to be funny these days and make fun of people because. Everybody's so sensitive, you know? The, this See, is a period like of heightened awareness, yeah. Everybody's really oversensitive. And so I wrote a song about the Amish people. I figure they can't complain. They're never going to hear it. They're never going to be streaming you know, electricity. it. Yeah. <laughs> not, they're not Mennonites. They're Amish, so. Yeah. Yeah, good target, yeah. Yeah, they, they can't complain, so. It's called... It's a funny, funny, funny lyrics in it, though. I'm sick of living like the Amishes, but I must admit the girls are really cute. They do have a look. So, I mean... It was really insulting, but... At this stage of your career, 
do you still look at things through a punk rock filter? Do you still is it an us against them mentality? Do you still do you still consider yourself punk rock? At times, at times I do. At times I think this wouldn't be tolerated in, back then. You know, um, it's nice to look. Nice to, at times look things through a punk rock filter. It gives you, gives you brings you down to a certain level. It's necessary to be down at sometimes. Uh, kind of humbles you, and you can uh, you can say that's just bullshit. That's just we just don't do things that way. It's just the wrong way of doing things. Like um, back in the day, it was really important to me that that bands like Journey didn't exist anymore, and bands like uh, like heavy metal that would go on and on with solos forever. We, we hated solos. We were anti-solo. We, they can hear doesn't have any solos in their music. Mm-hmm. We have we have riffs that sound like solos, but they're played over and over, and it's the same same, same way every time. I'm anti-solo. I'm anti-long songs. I think songs should be under four minutes. <laughs> Three minutes, really. And you can say what you have to say. That amount of time, if you can't say it, then you get off stage, you know? That's punk rock. Yeah. Yep. Got it. All right, so I know today... All right, hang on. Elliot Serrano says, um, the Amish girls are cute in that early pilgrim sort of way. He gets us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's a fetching look. In a very non-electric kind of way. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I, I think sometimes not revealing that much that much skin can be kind of sensual and exciting in its own way. It's the mystery. It's the allure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you, the, one of the reasons you're in the area, I mean, we mentioned you live out uh, in a more rural setting now. Uh, you're in the area because Naked Raygun is rehearsing today. Right. I might argue Naked Raygun need not rehearse, but you are rehearsing today. Um, it's nice. We need a lot of rehearsal. <laughs> so you've got a rehearsal coming up. Uh, I should mention again, you're opening up for Jawbreaker. It's Jawbreaker, Naked Raygun, and the Smoking Popes. Holy crap. That, top to bottom, it's a show. And it's interesting. I, I would say every band on that bill has been in a situation where the cycle has finally come around where people thought, oh my God, this man needs another another go-round. Happened to the Smoking Popes, happened to Naked Ray Gun, and Jawbreaker, too. Like, second chance sounds kind of cliche, but each one of these bands has enjoyed new life a decade or so after they really had their heyday. It's very, very complimentary. Very, very nice that people still listen to us. Especially not putting out any new records, you know? Yeah. I don't know about Smoking Popes, but they... They have a new record out next month. They're, they're very prolific, they seem like... Josh Caterer, Voice of an Angel. Good. He, he <laughs> certainly does. Um, but uh, it's good that they put out new records. Absolutely. I have, lot, I have a lot more to say. I have a lot more songs. I have a whole solo thing that I've, I've been working on for a long time. It's Every once in a while when I write a song that's not a Reagan, Naked Reagan song, I... How do, you make, how do you make that distinction? They just don't sound like Naked Reagan songs. They sound completely different. Sound like I'm, fa- I'm fascinated. And I want to. I want to hear this. <laughs> one of them was named for the movie The It Press File. It's a movie that, that it's the first movie that Michael Caine. <laughs> one of the first movies Michael Caine ever made. I mean, have have a milkshake. I don't know that a milkshake's the best way to wash that down, but one of the first movies Michael Caine ever made on the It Press File. It's it's like when they first figured out that they could put a guy on the screen who doesn't talk much. He could be a secret agent guy. Mm-hmm. And a really cool. It was a cool look and not t- uh, talk talk very much, and it, the plot would kind of carry it. It kind of led the way for all the James Bond movies, I think. I don't think there were James Bond movies before that. But um, the first file, great movie. So you wrote a song about that. It's it just wrote, it's a it's a non non vocal song, just just instrumental. Okay. It's like kind of like the riff that could play during the song or something. I love it. All right, so the next time we can see you is. Uh at the Aragon. Uh, Brian Bush just checked in. Naked Raygun, one of the most underrated bands in my opinion. Definitely one of the most important from youth growing up in Northwest Indiana. That's got to feel good to hear stuff like nice, that. Yeah. That's got to feel amazing. Um, so we'll see you and at some point we'll get that new music which is awesome. Long overdue. We need a label. You got to mix it. We'll get a label though. Either that we'll put it on ourselves these days. He says you can do that. DIY. You can, you can probably do it more successfully yourself. Keep more of your pay, money. Pay more attention to it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You, you know the person working it is going to be full on, full on invested right. in its success. Right. All right, Jeff Pizzotti, you are a hero. Uh, thank you for eating diner food in my car. You're welcome. And, thank uh, you for buying it for me. Uh, 
Love and Adore You. This podcast brought to you by Boost Mobile. Naked Raygun, Jeff Pizzotti. See him at the Aragon. Listen to their new music. And uh, if you like Carcon Carne, please tell a friend, carconcarne.com. Oh, and real quick before we go, um, Althea says, super pumped flying in for this show on my birthday. And Kurt says, hell yeah, the best. He's not talking about the Benedict. He's talking about Naked Freakin' Raygun. All right, thank you for watching and listening.